Okay, welcome everyone. I am very pleased to welcome you to the SICE Foreign Policy Institute's Coffee Hour, where we are going to be talking about women's leadership in a time of crisis. With me today, uh, I have my colleague, Shamila Chowdhury, with whom I'm gonna be undertaking a conversation about this important topic. Uh, Shamila is, in addition to being a fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute along with me, she's president of the American Pakistan Foundation and a foreign policy practitioner specializing in US foreign policy in South Asia. She's a senior fellow um, in South Asia at the Washington DC think tank the New America um, Foundation, in addition to her position at the Foreign Policy Institute. I'm also a fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute where I've served for five years, along with my 18 years at SICE. And prior to that, I served on the board of directors at the Asian Development Bank in the Philippines. The Foreign Policy Institute, for those of you that are not familiar with it, because I know this is largely an internal audience, you may not remember that it was established in 1980. Um, and it works to link the worlds of scholarship and policy in the search for realistic solutions to international challenges facing the US and the world. So the topic that we're addressing today is very much within the sweet spot of the topics that are covered by the Foreign Policy Institute. Our executive director, Dr. Carla Freeman, expresses her regrets for not being able to join us today. So I'm gonna give a very brief introduction with some statistics and maybe just a little bit of thinking before I get into my questions for our guest, Shamila, and my colleague. So since 1960, 57 countries worldwide have been led by women. It started in 1960 with Sri Lanka's Surimaivo Bandra Naiki, who became the world's first female head of state. Finland and New Zealand have led the way since then in terms of numbers, electing three women leaders each. At the start of 2020, there were 15 heads of state of UN countries, but since the number has fallen to 13. There are few women at the top among the world's most powerful nations, and Angela Merkel, her 14-year tenure as head of state stands out, as does the 11-year tenure of Margaret Thatcher of the UK and Indira Gandhi, who served twice as Prime Minister of India for a total of 16 years. That said, just last year, the European Council picked two outstanding women to head two very important institutions in Europe, Ursula von der Leyen as president of the European Commission and Christine Lagarde as president of the European Central Bank. And then I was struck by a New York Times editorial on May 1st that said, in a crisis, true leaders stand out. And it was three women that were featured. And the masterclass for how to respond to a crisis belongs to Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand, who chose to go hard and early in her response with swift and decisive actions, even when it carried political risk. So it's surely one of the most important hallmarks of leadership in a crisis. And so I'm going to turn now to Shamila with questions, kind of leading from that New York Times editorial, swift and decisive action, leadership in a time of crisis, even when there are political risks. So that's what the New York Times thought about what leadership in a crisis means. Shamila, how about you? What do you think leadership means in a time of crisis? Well, um, first, let me just say thank you so much um, to the Foreign Policy Institute and my um, family at SAIS, um, who I miss very much, by the way, um, for um, hosting this conversation today. Thank you so much, Cinnamon and um, uh, Danny, for organizing. Um, so I, you know, when I, first saw that we were gonna have this conversation, the first thing that came to mind was um, uh, some headlines that I saw, which were focused on like women leaders are um, standing out now because mm -hmm. they're better at certain things. And of course, naturally I'm like, uh, <laughs> yeah, of course we are, <laughs> like I was about saying. But you, we have to unpack this. We can't be so essentialist in our understanding of gender and power and um, political power if, um, at that. And, and so this question of what does leadership during a crisis mean, mean is very important before we even get to the gender component. And the way I see it is the way that leaders are currently responding to the crisis is not a product of the crisis. It's a product of what has happened before the crisis. 
it's a product of the relationships between the leaders, their governments, the people, the stakeholders, and then the public square. And the, the, the public square meaning the, the culture of expression and democracy and engagement between the state institutions and, and leadership. And that's, I think, where you can see the biggest um, mm -hmm. distinctions in the leadership um, globally. So you have, on the one hand, folks like Trump and Boris Johnson and Bolsonaro, all people who are very autocrat have autocratic tendencies and dealing with like heavily divided electorates, all who happen to be men as well. And th they're standing in stark contrast with people like Merkel and Ardern and other leaders who happen to be women who have very different relationships with their electorates and very different systems and um, dynamics vis-a-vis -vis these issues like um, you know, political partisanship and equality um, and, and gender dynamics. So I think that there's it's actually like far more complicated than it seems in terms of like what is leadership now because they're all all these leaders are products of these environments that they've been feeding for a long time, right? And mm -hmm. so the danger in that I see is that we run the risk of like pigeonholing certain women leaders as empaths or that in their only empaths and then one day they'll have to make tough decisions and that might you know, put them into this, um, it, it might limit them politically, if you will. And, and so I've been, I've been struggling a little bit with this gender dynamic that's been identified because I, I actually don't think it's necessarily good for a lot of the women leaders in terms of their political space that, that, that they will have to operate in the future to make tough decisions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shamila. Um, I agree with you that we run that risk, and that's what really stood out about that New York Times piece that said she chose to go hard and early and very decisive. And so it wasn't empathetic with political risks associated with her early decisions and just really step right in as a decisive, clear leader. And so you're right that if we focus too much on the empathetic and more gender stereotypes that go along with women leaders, I think you're right. We are missing a lot of what is going on these days. I don't think people would necessarily point to those two women that I, um, Ursula von der Leyen and Christine Lagarde um, at the European Central Bank. Um, if we think about their leadership style, it's not empathetic. It's really clear and decisive and really based on facts and science yeah. and hard information. So if we look at the leadership qualities, maybe it's really gender neutral in a way. Because if we take a look back at those words, um, which are go hard and ready, swift and decisive action, even when it carries political risk, that those yeah. are some of the most decisive qualities of a leader that's really not specific to a woman is it yeah no it's not and i guess that it opens up this question of um what are the skills that we're actually focusing on right, right. in addition to what you said i mean there's some other things that people have identified that these leaders who happen to be women are doing so they're they're communicating in a very straightforward way in a way that's sim simplified for a mass audience Empathy is one of those things, but we'll put it to the side. They're not using the crisis as a political opportunity. They're also um, very uh -huh. um, smart and trained in certain things, right? So Merkel is a scientist and that probably uh -huh. is a reason for why she's handled it this way. And then they all have good management skills. So what I thought, when I thought about the skills, what I thought was interesting is that the, all of these qualities in a leader stand in contrast with what populist movements are prioritizing in leadership. And that's, I think, another reason, it, we're noticing it more because there, those qualities are in effect being rejected by some countries in the political choices they have made, right? And I think it's a way of pointing to say, hey, look, they actually are doing a lot of these things and it seems to be working really well, for example, in the case of New Zealand. Exactly. So I think those are very good uh, points, Shamila, because you're right, the background of um, Angela Merkel as a scientist, this has been cited in, in a lot of analysis about what makes her so effective as a leader and uh, has allowed her to stay in power 
for 14 years, which is just remarkable um, in this day and age. But also good management skills and good communication skills, being able to get out a clear message. And perhaps the softer side that people in a gender stereotype associate with women makes it easier for them, I'm just speculating here, to get out a tough message and that it's disarming in a way. Um, and so that that may be just another advantage that women can bring. But are there other ways, are there other aspects of leadership that we may be overlooking? Um, for example, like generation specific um, aspects of leadership that may be associated with a particular generation. So the greatest generation. So if we think about people in their 70s, um, the, that may be World War II um, associated with, or the Korean War, um, veterans from that generation, or of the baby boomers. Are there generation-specific skills that if we look at the male-female divide that we may be overlooking that would give us good insights into what is most effective in a time of crisis for a leader to that, draw that's upon? That's a good question. I mean, there's a few different ways to think about it. One is if you, you know, if you think about political leadership and the people who are in senior levels as it's a generational issue, mostly, mm -hmm. right? There, so there's like an age, there's often an age gap between like leaders and then people who are not leaders. Uh -huh. and I think that um, in the case of um, New Zealand, you have a fairly young leader who has a different leadership style. And that is, it does stand in contrast to um, the leadership style of say ba the baby boomer generation, if we're thinking about it in the Western context, right? And someone who is, you know, I believe she's 39. She yeah. has seen a lot more, I would say, um, different kinds of challenges than say a person of the baby boomer generation has. I don't actually want to turn this into a tirade against the boomers because I will actually <laughs> so I don't want to get into trouble with anybody. But I, I think that um, the in, in the case of the United States, the younger you are, say if you're in the millennial generation, you're going to be looking for different things from these leaders. You know, there's certain sense uh, senses of inequality and injustice that you demand to be addressed that don't get addressed from somebody say like Donald Trump, who's the president right now, mm -hmm. right? And gender does play a role into this because it's experiential. So if you're, and, and it, it, it's not gender specifically, it's diversity. So if there's a diversity of leaders, different kinds of um, backgrounds and skills and educational experiences, you as an institution or as a state or organization have a better chance of making more robust, comprehensive um, decisions and, mm -hmm. having, and having more diverse ideas. And I think that's what we see happening and playing out in some of these other countries that have more equitable environments for leaders to emerge from. And there's more diversity in their um, in, in their kind of industries and sectors. And, and so you have people who are bringing in an empathetic perspective. You have people who are bringing in a very kind of strategic perspective as well, people who have communication skills. And so there's a much more comprehensive approach. I don't see that happening in the cases where there, there are these countries with these like autocratic style <laughs> leaders, right? And so uh -huh. and, and and we should be honest about the United States that it is not an equitable system for political like leadership when it comes to women. They're just not represented very well. It's always better than what it used to be. But I, I don't think that um, we, you can't compare ourselves to New Zealand, right? I mean, we're, we're far worse off than they are in terms of our, um, our system being equitable. Um, so the, the generation question is interesting. Let me, let me put something else out there on the generation thing. It's a little bit different. I was thinking about this as I was um, brainstorming for this conversation. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the conversation on gender and what, it, what gender is has evolved quite a bit in the United States. And in, in particular, if you talk to, you know, if you're under the age of 35, you have a very different understanding of what gender is and then how that translates into leadership and leadership style. And 
then I think that informs your biases in a different way, right? And so we may be, some, somebody may be looking at a female leader and saying, oh, they're very empathetic or they're this or they're that. But I think if you're in your 20s and you have a totally different understanding of gender and identity, then you may not have those same biases, right? So I, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the perspectives we're getting fed are very generation based and they're, they're, they're very much based on that like generation who has the political power for the most part. And I'm talking about the context of the US. Yeah, um, Shamila, I want to move over to just post COVID for a, a moment here. And what do you think the chances are of greening the recovery? Because we certainly hear a lot from the uh, Gen Z right now, is that the correct term? And the millennial generation and those younger generations about can we green the recovery? Can we build back better? And so if you maybe explore that, are there gender dimensions for the possibilities of greening the recovery or is it more generational? When you say greening, are you talking more specifically about climate change policies or just overall? Yes, uh, yeah. climate change policies uh, and also of conserving biodiversity. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I see it's a good question and I see this um, um, in the context again of like what kind of political environment you're, mm -hmm. you're operating within and what kind of leadership you have, what's your relationship with your constituent base. And I think that of course women can lead the, the way uh, in particular through special interest groups and in the NGO space, I think those voices can be very critical. Mm -hmm. But if you're a leader who is a woman and has to negotiate the prospect of um, economic recovery and um, continuing this um, progressive climate change agenda, I think it's gonna be a little bit tougher for you because you have a lot of issues to negotiate and livelihoods are at stake. And so it doesn't necessarily throw the whole agenda out the window, but I do think that it complicates it because um, of just basic necessities not being met. It's going to be a big challenge, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, do you buy into the whole, um, I associate this with Tom Friedman, basically jobs creation within a green economy. And so that if you've got jobs in renewable energy, for example, um, or in reducing emissions, or of reducing waste, um, of preserving our environment, that this creates opportunities and jobs. And so I think he's been very articulate, and I find his arguments persuasive, uh, but how about you? You know, I get, again, I think that there's plenty of opportunity in that space, like just as there was pre-COVID, mm -hmm. but I think we should look at it in a much broader way that like women have been extremely affected by the pandemic and adversely affected in that like there's a lot of women that just participate in the informal economy, right? And right. So what are they going to do, right? How do you integrate them into a formal economy that produces more jobs that are related to, you know, a, a, this new green economy? I think that's, so, so that's a question. I, we're not there yet is what I'm saying, right? And in, in, then you have to look at the, the difference between developed societies and developing societies, right? And so I think in developing societies, there's much more um, women impacted by the, the lack of informal um, economic opportunities. There, the gen simply doesn't exist in this country. Mm -hmm. and frankly, it doesn't exist here either. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's just uh, the whole agricultural subsistence economy of sub-Saharan Africa, so many of the small holders and the small businesses and um, agriculture is controlled and contributed to by women. And so if we really think it's really about food security, um, right. that is a huge issue there. So um, I agree with you, it's a lot more complicated than that. So uh, let's just maybe segue over because we're talking about poverty reduction. One of the facts that has jumped out at me that is that if we think about the sustainable development goals that the world agreed to, to meet by 2030, and their goal is to eradicate poverty extreme poverty by 2030. And that has just definitely um, been put out of reach by this whole COVID-19 crisis. Do you see women playing a significant role in keeping that on the front of the agenda for world leaders uh, to meet their commitments 
uh, against that most important sustainable development goal? Yeah, so first I would say the UN has done a great job of pushing out how this uh, pandemic has continues to affect women and vul very vulnerable women um, all over the world. Um, they've got some great reporting out there. Um, I think that they most definitely will have um, an impact. And I'll give you an example from India, which um, gives me a lot of hope. So, you know, India has um, responded in a very dramatic way by just having a very like strict shutdown, lockdown, and it did impact a lot of um, vulnerable women, uh, day laborers, that sort of thing. But what we are seeing is that at very local levels in all of the provinces, the women's organizations that have been supported through like World Bank funding and other multilateral support for years now, um, and they're all part of the women's movement, they've actually stepped up to help themselves and each other by providing certain services and um, kind of providing jobs. And they've shifted completely. They're doing things that are like, you know, they're sewing like face masks and they're running kitchens for people who need food. And, and so there's, a, there's an interesting response from this um, in that kind of local development space mm -hmm. that gives me a lot of hope. And it's being driven by women. And it's, I think their experience as a disenfranchised group that, you know, they, and they've built these networks essentially to respond to crises. And that's what crisis management is, by the way. It's not uh -huh. like knowing the right thing to do when the bad stuff happens. It's actually having systems in place to support each other and to respond to whatever happens because you can't predict, right? This is a completely exogenous event. And yet they've, they've been building these networks for several decades now. So they're able to like put them into action. So I suspect that the same thing is happening in other countries where there are similar um, local development challenges and the, the international institutions have been involved. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that, actually. Uh, um, Shamila, I wanted to, I, I will be very happy to share those or open it to the audience in just a moment. But just to say, is there something specific about South Asia or Pakistan in particular? This was a great example from India that gives you some hope. Are there bright spots coming from Pakistan um, that you would be able to share with us? Yeah, I, I think that there are. Um, the, in Pakistan, I can give you a few um, high-level examples. Um, there are, Pakistan has a good history of appointing women to like very mm -hmm. senior positions, like prime minister, obviously, and other obviously. positions. Um, and so there's good role models there. Um, I think what the current government has done well is that they've put key women, or it, they put women who are very accomplished in key positions to manage the pandemic. So, so um, Sonia Nishtar is one of the women who's overseeing the, the pandemic response and she's well known in the global health community. And another woman who is a former Google exec is responsible for managing digital Pakistan. And she's, she's that was just her job before the pandemic, but what she's done is actually taken the digital platforms in Pakistan and created an uh, opportunity to engage the diaspora to give back. And so there's a whole initiative to bring um, Pakistani um, doctors from the diaspora and to provide telemedicine services, for example. So that, and that's at a national scale, very senior position held by a woman. And I think that's a, a great example. What you don't see though, is all of the philanthropic work that's happening in the country. The philanthropic networks are very strong. The charitable networks are very strong. And that exists in a lot of countries where the state has basically um, failed on its obligations to the people or it's decentralized so much that the provincial governments are not capable of, of responding yet. And so uh, women are at the forefront of these philanthropic networks because that being um, kind of excluded informally from the economy has kind of pushed that uh, push women in Pakistan into these, uh, you know, NGO spaces or, you know, care, you know, the social work system essentially, but now they're on the front lines of the pandemic. And um, I, I have to say, I have nothing but good things to say about all of those local responses, they're doing amazing work. Which is fantastic. You know, I am going to share with everyone um, an, uh, uh, an opinion and commentary from the IMF that came out earlier that said uh, just um, earlier, uh, about a month ago. So some say there's a trade-off, save lives or save jobs. And their point is that it's a false dilemma and that the services that have been expanded through the IMF just really, 
say that you can have both, um, that you can save lives and create jobs, not just in the healthcare system. So the examples, Shamila, that you gave just of women sewing masks and women opening kitchens to provide food that is required for families during this COVID-19 crisis. Those are great examples. Also, um, the multilateral development banks have increased their lending to get access to credit for the unbanked. And so the unbanked communities are getting access to credit and banking services, not only banking services and credit, but know-how about how to be even better about small-scale agriculture or healthcare or small family handicrafts businesses, such as selling masks, uh, yeah. sewing and then selling masks. So I would say there's a lot of hope out there that I find is underreported and perhaps misreported. And as the IMF has really challenged us, it's really a false uh, dilemma or a false trade off between saving lives or saving uh, livelihoods. Yeah, no, that's, and, a, that's a good point. And w one thing I would add to that is mm -hmm. it's, we've also been looking at women's leadership in a very like um, linear way and, and very mm -hmm. hierarchical. We're just looking at heads of states. And I think if you look at women who are in, like we were talking about at the very local level in these self-help groups, like they're going to, some of these are very poor communities. And if, let's look at the leadership skills they've displayed in responding to, to the pandemic. I mean, they've been shown that they're resilient. They're very cura courageous flexible mm -hmm. right and they mm -hmm. have um you know they have to have good listening skills and communication skills to kind of figure out what people need and so those are the kind of leadership skills that are in need and in demand when a, a global crisis hits right and, and i think people are noticing that those are coming from women because they probably had to use all of those skills in their experiences of being a woman <laughs> Yes, right, exactly. So resilient, courageous, flexible, I think those are really great, great adjectives to describe a woman leader. Um, what I'm going to do is open it up for questions now, but I'm going to save five minutes at the end of this because there are two really exciting events that are following up tomorrow at SICE and then next week at our sister um, APSIA School, the Association of Schools of uh, professional schools of international affairs at Georgetown um, that I'm going to call out to everybody, but certainly SICE Women Leads has a really interesting event tomorrow. So let me just uh, move over to see if there's anybody, if it use your hand raise function, and I will be pleased to call on anybody that would like to ask a question of either Shamila or me. Um, all right. Let's see, anybody here? Okay, because uh, I've got other questions for you if while our audience is thinking this through. Um, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, who does? Afshin. Oh, Afshin, yeah. okay, was, Afshin, actually, okay, very good. I was actually looking for the hand raise uh, function. I, I see chat function, I don't see hand raise on my Zoom. Uh, good to see you. Uh, good to see you, Shamila. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, option. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Cinnamon. Thank you. Sure, uh, you're very welcome. This really uh, um, interesting conversation. Um, you know, I, I think, um, uh, you know, Cinnamon touched on it a little bit, but, I, but I've always been fascinated, Shamila, and I wanted to, you know, maybe zoom in on it a little bit more, is, is the, the number of female leaders in um, South Asia. Um, you know, and is, is this just a function of, of, you know, political dynasties, you know, where, where you know, um, daughters of prominent leaders are, are you know, are, are catapulted into, you know, positions, whether as we've seen in, you know, Pakistan, as we've seen in, in India, as we've seen in, you know, Bangladesh, um, or is there something else, you know, uh, in the water here? Um, I, I just wanted to really to hone in on that because I've always wanted to explore that question a little bit further. And then I, I wanted to ask a question of Cinnamon as well. Okay, um, Shamila, I can just jump in here with some statistics. Yeah. Yep. Because, um, so India's uh, only female prime minister was served twice for a total of 16 years. Right. Argentina had two female presidents, both of whom succeeded their husbands. Mm -hmm. um, Australia, Brazil, Indonesia, South Korea, and Turkey have each had one female leader serving between three and five years. And um, so those are some statistics. And of course, 
one of our past prime ministers of Pakistan mm -hmm. was a woman. And if you take a look at Bangladesh, yeah. so many women uh, leaders in Bangladesh have mm -hmm. served as prime minister. Mm -hmm. So just to say that that kind of, is it a part of a dynasty or succeeding their husbands? Afshin, I would say that that's a phenomenon of, that's not just unique to uh, South Asia. Mm -hmm. um, because in Indonesia, for example, uh, the one woman Indonesian president, head of state, was the daughter of a former president, right? right. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I guess, okay, let's, in short, your, the answer to your question is yes, but it's not that simple. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So let's take a step back to something I said earlier, which is, you know, we're seeing um, more equitable countries manage the response better to the pandemic and their female leaders that are doing it. And um, if you were to look at South Asia and let, let's take Pakistan, for example, and, and say, ask, is it an equitable society for women? And then you compare it to the United States and say, is the United States an equitable society for women? At face value, most people would say, well, the US is much more equitable for women. It's safer, there's more opportunity, there's more mobility, et cetera. Yet Pakistan has had these senior female leaders and the United States has not. So there's something happening, right? There's a difference. And I would say that, um, you know, obviously the political dynasties in a lot of these countries facilitate the rise of, of women to power because it's through their family names or the protecting a family legacy that they come into these positions. But I would also think about it in terms of the elite capture of the state and to the extent that that exists and it's how strong it is will determine like, will women be afforded these opportunities of being part of a political dynasty, right? And so I, I think what we've seen in the case of Pakistan is that there is an elite capture of the state, but the civilians are limited in that elite capture because there's other dynamics at play with the military. And, and there's, it's also a small political elite. And so when you run out of, say, sons to take leadership positions in your political party that you've dominated, then it's only natural that you're going to go to a family member over somebody else because that's how they've built their political influence over time. And I haven't seen any party try to challenge that with the exception of um, the current prime minister, like his, his party isn't dynastic yet and his children are too small. So um, I don't see that happening, but we don't have enough data or real life um, possibility to answer that just yet. But otherwise, it's all based on family um, control of political parties. And I, I think size matters. It would be interesting to like look at the size of like political elites and the number of political parties and then the, the rate of female leadership. I think all of that is probably connected a little bit. And these countries have, have many, on many occasions used the example of very senior female leaders as um, kind of uh, buttons they can push against like the United States saying, well, like, why are you badgering us about women's rights when you've never had a female president, right? Um, but I think there's, there's just a lot more nuance there. Great, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, great answer, Shamila. thank you. So Afshin, you said you had one for me too? Uh, yes, I did, um, Cinnamon. If, if, I don't know if you, if, have you seen anything that you can point uh, us to anything or anything that you've written or, or thought about lately about how um, the, the whole COVID-19 crisis is going to be affecting women in the developing world. I realize that's a huge you know, uh, topic, but anything that you've seen out there or that you're thinking about or writing about, because one of the things that we've seen at least in the past 30 years or so as the developing world has risen and as, as the macro numbers have started to look better, as you know, we've seen greater you know, f women's access to education and opportunity, the, the charts seem to be moving up and to the right. You know, what I fear is, is you know, like, like in everything, the charts are just being exploded. And, I, and I, I'd love to get your thoughts on, on what this all means for some of the progress that we've seen for women in the developing world. Um, excellent question. And I started to answer that by my question that I posed to Shamila mm -hmm. about the SDG, about eradicating extreme poverty by 2030, mm -hmm. and that that very laudable, worthy goal is going to be not met because of the COVID-19 crisis and because so many of the families in poverty are women-headed households and because so many women work at subsistence level jobs or in the informal sector, that this is going to really hit them 
much more severely than anyone has a good handle on. Mm -hmm. And so I would say it's very sobering and it's not good news. So therefore, when I take a look at the institutions that I work on at SICE, the international financial institutions, the IMF, the multilateral development banks, and indeed I look at the social enterprise sector where jobs are created in the real economy, um, generating profits, but also providing opportunities for people often at the very most basic levels addressing some of the most pressing social problems. I find hope in that area, but it is not large enough yet to be able to make the kind of impact that's going to be needed, Afshin, to address the crushing um, loss of economic growth potential around the world that we're seeing. I mean, our colleague um, here at the Foreign Policy Institute, John Lipsky, mm -hmm. gave a couple of seminars, including one just a couple of weeks ago, where he pointed to the IMF's further um, downgrading their projections for growth um, and how much negative growth the world is going to see. And it's not looking very good for next year, despite all of the heroic actions of central banks around the world, indeed heroic actions by the IMF itself that will be able to mobilize up to a trillion dollars. This is yeah. very significant. And then the you know, debt standstills um, mm -hmm. that have been led uh, by the IMF and by the World Bank and by the private sector through the Institute for International Finance. All of these things are very hopeful, but they're at a very uh, macro level. You were really talking about the impact on women and I would say it's underappreciated in those spheres and it's going to be severe. Mm -hmm. I, wish I, I wish I had statistics for you. Sure. Uh, yeah, Shamila. Um, one thing I would say also, we haven't, um, I haven't read too much about this and this would be a great thing to write once we have more data is like no one's talking about the impact of the pandemic on foreign aid budgets and if you think about what happened after 9-11 to just U.S. foreign assistance and then all of, it, all of its partners like everything shifted towards terrorism and so you can presume that a lot of funding now will get shifted towards public health and then what is the cost there to for, you know, foreign aid um, packages and the focus on issues like gender, which, you know, are very hard to get people's attention anyway, right? And if, if certain countries stop leading in that regard, then I think there's all these other consequences that have to be dealt with by other measures. So that, I mean, that's again, where philanthropy becomes very important and charitable networks, right. et cetera. Right. You know, the right, one bright you. spot in this, um, Shamila, I agree with you, is that um, DFID um, has really, and the UK has very much reaffirmed its commitment to 0.7% of GNP uh, in terms of its own foreign aid budget. And I think part of that is political in the sense of this post-Brexit world of wanting to stand out as a leader. And that's one way of the UK demonstrating its global leadership. And so that's one bright spot that I'm aware of, but I agree with you, it would be very interesting to take a look at the impact, especially USAID, the MCC here in the United States, uh, the New Development Finance Corporation, right? Uh, what do their budgets look like and other um, aid agencies around the world? Mm -hmm. Certainly the very um, deep pocketed um, Norwegian um, foreign aid programs are continuing very robustly. And so I think you would wanna to look towards the Nordics for their leadership there as well. But I think it's a very, very good research topic. Um, mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah. Um, other questions that people have, um, I'm gonna look for hands, actual physical hands uh, like that, uh, or um, chats. Let's see, I see some people on chat. Um, so let's see. Uh, so in light of the phenomenon that shows women leaders managing the crisis better, are there op opportunities for policy learning and knowledge accumulation here? Yes. Before now, leadership effectiveness, especially in these policy and power domains, is constructed for the mass, from the, for the masculine perspective. Given these unfolding events, is there a possibility of reframing these narratives about power and effectiveness? Is there a possibility about reframing about power and effectiveness? Yes. 
if the core realm of the state is to protect its citizens, and these women leaders have done that, should we not make a case for a paradigm shift in leadership going forward? Well said, yes. Okay, so I've said yes, yes, yes. Shamila, <laughs> uh, those are my opinions. Of, well, what would you say? And then I'd be very happy to supplement. Yeah, so just a few thoughts. Really good question. Um, I mean, I think part of it is we can say yes here all we want until the cows come home, but part of it is up to the people that vote leaders into office. And if you know, you look at trends around the world and the rise in populist sentiment, it doesn't seem that this kind of leadership is much appreciated in, you know, various epicenters across the, the world. So it's something to pay a great deal of attention to. And if you know, if I were um, teaching um, future policy leaders, you know, which my colleagues are doing every day, um, I would definitely be making a case for a more kind of responsible and comprehensive leadership style. Responsible is the key word here because you can't just say stuff, right? In a crisis management, you can't just say stuff. And I think what populism has enabled, and that's, I'm just using it, it's really broad term, it's, I, don't, I don't mean to use it so casually, but it's enabled, it's enabled a leadership style that's not educated and that, de that doesn't value it, right? And, and, and so then you just say stuff. And I think, okay, then this is really important here because when you have a crisis, there's like a special like group of people that are always dealing with crisis communication. It's, it's something that needs to be studied. And I think in this case, we should, I mean, the lesson here is not like these women leaders did this and these male leaders didn't. Let's analyze the communication styles and narratives that these successful leaders in the pandemic shaped in their countries. How were they talking? What words were they using? Because you can't take um, political narratives out of this. It, you, everyone is being, I mean, Jacinda Ardern is still a politician, right? She's still politicking to her constituency, but we want to understand like, why did her political narrative resonate better than say someone else's? So there's a really interesting um, study in communications that I think we have to look at. And then we have to also look at like, what do like when when people want to be policy leaders or run for office i mean what are the like what are the values that are motivating them i mean there's th this is like a really bigger this is a bigger question right and in the united states what we've seen is that um leadership is elected leadership is it used to be that you could be a doctor or a teacher or whatever and then you would go into elected office for a little bit and then you'd go back to your your profession now we have professional politicians who are like trying to just stay on to the next election. And then they, you know, that's not leadership. That's something else, right? And I think there's a problem in our political system here that has enabled um, like weak leadership to be on display. And then things don't, you know, when you're in a crisis and you need somebody who's like a Jacinda Ardern, you don't have it because the system never enabled it. So there's a, I, I think there's something else happening with the profession that needs to be talked about as well. Cinnamon, what do you think? Um, I agree with you, Shamila. I, what I was just doing is taking a look here is that I think I'm going to go back to those adjectives. So the New York Times, the swift and decisive decision making and leadership and guidance, even when it carries risks. And Shamila, yours, uh, resilient courageous and flexible. So um, in answer to these excellent questions, I would say, yes, let's call for a paradigm shift in leadership, but let's call for swift and decisive leadership, even when it carries risk. Let's call for resilient, courageous and flexible leadership. And um, Shamila, your point about that this applies to people at the very top, so the Christine Lagardes, um, the Kristalina Gorgieva, um, the Ursula von der Leyen, um, those women at the top, or Angela Merkel, uh, head of state, and um, or Jacinda uh, in New Zealand, that it's, it applies equally to women at the very top of institutions of states, but also as heads of households or heads of their own small businesses. I think the paradigm shift that we are seeing that has been so effective and that inspires us 
despite this global pandemic, that those are qualities that we're looking for. So the paradigm shift would be in the qualities that we see, that we admire. Why do we admire them? Because they've been effective um, and they inspire us. Um, other questions? Uh, that was a great one. Uh, let's see. Uh, getting here, um, anybody else? Uh, am I missing anybody? You know, one of the things that I point to, um, I, I'm a great fan of Christine Lagarde. When she was the uh, managing director at the, at, at the IMF, one of the things that she very courageously led in the policy dialogues, those Article Four consultations, which is a surveillance function of the IMF, was to call for reductions in fossil fuel subsidies, which is a way of grading the future. Kristalina Gorgieva, um, in her prior positions at the World Bank, um, was also very instrumental in some of her environmental positions. And so I'm answering my own question, Shamila, there about do I, I, I want to see hope for greening the recovery? And I think that women in positions of leadership, you're, uh, Christine Lagarde at the European Central Bank, Kristalina Gorgieva as the managing director of the IMF, and the women heads of state who have been swift and decisive and resilient and courageous and flexible and not falling for that false trade-off between health and jobs, um, that this is going to be a way of the future. Um, any other questions that people have? Um, okay. There's, someone, there's a, a hand raised from iPhone. There's a hand um, raised. Okay. Yes. I Yes, please, yes. go ahead. Um, so uh, this is uh, uh, Dr. Wampo. I actually sent um, the question that you just um, answered uh, concerning the, you know, the possibilities of a paradigm shift in, in leadership, given what's happening. But yes. I was also wondering, um, it would seem as though this global health crisis uh, is bringing into sharp focus the failures of foreign aid, particularly to developing countries. Um, you know, and so what I'm wondering is, again, is there, should we be re-examining, you know, our structures and systems and goals of foreign aid? For example, in Africa, it is very clear that the populations, right, vulnerable populations who actually need palliatives are not getting the help that they need, right? Um, that's one. Yes. Um, from, you know, from, from age two, the structures of foreign aid has broken down completely as states looking word, right? As both rich states and poor states, everybody's, you know, looking to um, survive, right? Uh, the, the, the pandemic looking to uh, take care of their citizens. Um, it's essentially a, a, a bit of an anarchic world at this point, um, not all the way, but, you know, the structures of international relations are breaking down, right? Even though there's a struggle to kind of uh, keep it going. And so the, my question is, at what point, right? Um, or do we envisage that this crisis will create a policy space for rearticulating our structures and systems um, of foreign aid, particularly to Africa? Um, Chi Chi, thank you. It's great to have you um, with us today. I really appreciate your attendance, especially as you're making preparations for your own big event tomorrow. Oh, absolutely. Um, so uh, it's great to have you. So you're absolutely right. This does call into question the nature of foreign aid. But I'd also ask you to take a critical look at the United States. Haven't we made poor choices here in this country by not acting swiftly and decisively enough in light of the science and evidence that was coming out. And we did not have enough test kits. We didn't have enough masks. We didn't have enough hospital beds. And so um, it just shows that 
policy decisions and investment decisions really need to be driven, you know, by Shamila's earlier point, by those fact-based, the fact that Angela Merkel is a scientist, perhaps, that enabled her to be able to be so swift and decisive and sure in her leadership in Germany. And so I would say, absolutely, those are very, very deep questions. And it was, you know, the earlier point about, isn't this time to take a look at uh, the impact on foreign aid budgets? But further than that, Chi Chi, to your point, not just the size, but the scope and how impact is measured. And to really take a look at very seriously what the lessons have been learned to date and to correct past errors. And to me, a lot of leadership is going to come from country foreign aid oversight and ministries of planning, ministries of health, ministries of agriculture, those areas that we really talked about today. Um, perhaps even ministries of commerce where they talk about creating jobs in the real sector. So I would say it's really not just foreign aid itself that we need to look at, but how foreign aid is selected, how it's delivered, how it's prioritized, and how it's measured. So that's a very complicated, open-ended answer. I just say, excellent question, Chi Chi. We don't, in the space of this coffee conversation, really have time to do it justice. Um, Shamila, anything to add there? Yeah, hi, Chi Chi. It's good to hear you. Um, so uh, I think like what we were saying earlier is that the pandemic has exposed all these different fault lines that pre-existed the pandemic, and mm -hmm. obviously foreign aid is, is definitely one of them. And it's going to continue to like foreign aid and other issues will be continue to help be held hostage to how this crisis has been managed. Um, so there's more to come there. But what I would, if I had to simplify it, which is hard, there's lots of things happening. But if I just simplify it, I would say that it's clear the pandemic. This isn't the first pandemic. This is also <laughs> not the first global crisis. But what this one has shown that it is very hard for most states to strike a balance between the safety, the ma like mass safety of its citizens and economic livelihoods, right? Like that's the main question is how do we keep people safe and make sure that they are not on the street, basically. And that's a hard, I mean, that's like a difficult thing to balance out. And if you then I think you build it from there, right? If that's like the central tension here, and then there are all these other tensions associated with that, then I think you can look at things like foreign aid. You can also look at domestic um, budgets and how things are allocated, which gets to what Cinnamon was saying is, this is gonna call into question all kinds of um, budgeting and assistance. And I, I think the other thing that it's uh, we were not talking about is just the entire crisis management response structure in the United States and, and our ability to uh, respond to anything at any time. That's, that's a problem, right? And then you can get into these details about, about the budgets, but there's gonna be a lot of, um, I think, analysis after the fact of, um, you know, what do you need to have in place beyond just money to be able to respond to an exogenous dynamic like this. Um, good leadership and good management skills as, as you were pointing to earlier, Shamila. I'm very conscious of time and I see that we've got only about four minutes left and I promised that I was going to give a shout out to a couple of other events, including one at SICE tomorrow. So SICE Women Lead is doing its practicum presentations tomorrow and it collaborates, SICE Women Lead um, and our colleague, um, Dr. Uh, Chichi um, uh, Nuankor, uh, is going to be introducing the leadership teams and they are going to be sharing the research from their findings about um, mapping community approaches to gender-based violence in Nepal. 
increasing women's political participation in Ethiopia, and gender responsive disaster risk reduction in Cebu in the Philippines. They all sound really, really interesting. That's going to be tomorrow, May 14th at 2.30. So everybody, please tune into that. And then next week, so Chi Chi, um, we're all looking forward to that. And next week, Tuesday, May 19th. Thank um, you. Oh, you're welcome, of course. Um, the uh, Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security is having a similar session to today. So shout out to the Foreign Policy Institute, to Carla Freeman and Danny Shug for conceiving of this conversation. It's effective leadership in the time of COVID-19. And they are going to be featuring the ambassador, uh, the woman ambassador, Emily Haber of uh, Germany to the United States, Kara As, the ambassador of Norway to the United States, and Rosemary Banks, the ambassador of New Zealand to the United States, moderated by Ambassador Milan Verveer, um, who is the executive director of the Georgetown um, Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. So I'm definitely going to tune into that. And I'd just like to say thank you to everybody today for joining us. I've got a couple of notes. Um, I'm definitely going to send the IMF thought piece. Um, around which says that it's a false dilemma between jobs and health. And I think, you know, that's one of the themes that's come out in our discussion today. I found it very persuasive. Um, and so I commend it to you. It's a very short piece. So I will ask you to um, take a look at that. And then my closing remarks are just to say, Shamila, thank you so much. I think you've inspired us to think about resilient, courageous and flexible leadership. And I'd say that you exemplify all of those yourself. Um, it's such a delight to have had this opportunity to share the past hour with you. I wish you every, every continued success in all that you're doing. And Chi Chi, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, Cinnamon. Thank you. And it was okay. so great to see our, our size family. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Okay, bye.